Hello, and welcome to the Ryersonian Film Corner. I'm Dale Mulligan. And I'm Chris Thompson. Today, we'll be looking at Quentin Tarantino's latest film, The Hateful Eight. Let's take a look. One of them fellas is not what he says he is. What is he? In cahoots with this one, that's what he is. One of them, maybe even two of them, is here to see Dahmer Goo goes free. Are you sure you ain't just being paranoid? Our best bet is this duplicitous fella and his cool customers, Daisy here. He won't have the leather patience it takes to just sit here. He can't handle it. He'll stop waiting. Try and create his opportunity, and that's when Mr. Jumpy reveals himself. And what you got to say about all this? What I got to say about John Reese Ravens? He's absolutely right. Me and one of them fellows is in cahoots. We're just waiting for everybody to go to sleep. That's what we're gonna kill you. That was a clip from The Hateful Eight, the newest film from writer-director Quentin Tarantino and the subject of today's review. The film stars Kurt Russell as John the Hangman Ruth, a bounty hunter set on bringing in his captive fugitive to the town of Red Rock, Wyoming and claiming the five-figure reward. However, when a blizzard leaves John stuck in a cabin with a handful of strangers, he becomes paranoid that one or more of them may be in league with his captive. This film stars an excellent ensemble cast ranging from Tarantino veterans Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, and Samuel Jackson to newcomers Channing Tatum and Jennifer Jason Leigh. But even a star cast is not enough to save The Hateful Eight from being an overly long slog of a movie. With a runtime of over three hours, you'd be surprised how little actually happens. The film is padded with Tarantino's classic meandering, self-indulgent dialogue mostly centered around race relations in the post-Civil War setting in which it takes place. Now, this wouldn't bother me at all in a movie that had more going on, but here it only serves to emphasize how little of a plot there actually is. Tarantino sets out to make an intriguing and suspenseful mystery, but fails in both regards. What we get instead is a poorly paced mess of a movie with a twist that can be seen from a mile away. That being said, there were still some redeeming elements worth noting, the entire cast did an excellent job working with what they were dealt, with special mentions going to Jackson and Leigh, who kept the film afloat for most of its runtime. Tarantino also impresses with a hyper-violent display of special effects score in the later half of the movie, and Jackson delivers a memorable, if overly crass, monologue that may offend more conservative-minded viewers. However, this is par for the course whenever Quentin Tarantino makes a film, and here it feels less like a bold artistic leap and more of an uninspired return to formula. All in all, I feel that The Hateful Eight will go down as one of Tarantino's weakest films, an unfortunate smudge on an otherwise excellent track re record. Chris, what are your thoughts? Hateful Eight is definitely at the bottom of the rankings of the Tarantino films, but it is still so much better than most films out today. It is still incredibly enjoyable, and it is a great experience. However, it is three hours long. That is my biggest pet peeve of the movie, especially since there are, let's count them, one, two, three locations, maybe the majority of the movie taking place in the cabin. And for the first little bit of the movie, well, not little bit, I guess the hour, hour and a half, it is a lot of dialogue. And while Tarantino's dialogue is always riveting, it's always engaging, there's just so much of it and we're not bouncing around from place to place. We're not bouncing around to different settings, different characters. It's all the same place. And it becomes boring after a while. And only for me, in the last hour, when there's some, little, there's some conflict, does it become incredibly engaging. I was very, very engaged by the end of it, um, very involved in the characters, wondering what was going on. You said you saw the twist coming. I didn't happen to see it coming. I had a guess, my guess was wrong, and I was surprised by the ending, but it took so long to get there, and at points, I was bored. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very true. The ending was well done, very Quentin Tarantino, with a whole bucket full of blood, but really, getting there and getting to that point was just so much of a tiresome slog 
that it just didn't feel that it redeemed the movie. Yes, it, again, very tiresome, took a very long time. And along the way, we saw so much of Tarantino's signature on this film. So many times we've seen, again, this riveting dialogue, this kind of crass humor, violence, of course, lots and lots of blood and death, as expected in a Tarantino film, but again, seen before. And at one point, um, the, the narrator comes in to the story, narrated by Tarantino. And at this point, this was again another peeve of mine, it felt like Tarantino is almost kind of becoming self-indulgent. He's narrating his own film and um, highlighting this monologue that Jackson gives, but at the same time it's just <clears throat> sorry, Tarantino acknowledging himself. He's saying, look at this monologue, look at these characters, look at this backstory. By him being the narrator, it almost breaks the fourth wall. Hmm. And really, you we've seen all the scenes that have happened in this movie in previous Tarantino films, and a lot of the time, uh, they were a lot better in those previous films. Um, I'm thinking Reservoir Dogs. There was very much a mystery there of who uh, ratted them out to the police, and there was very good suspense throughout that movie, very well paced, and he just lost it in this one. It didn't work. The, yeah, the twist in Rev Reservoir Dogs, I'm glad you bring that up. I remember watching that, and again, I was so engaged in that, and when it happened, uh, spoiler alert for a 1992 film, um, when Tim Roth shot him, shot Mr. Blonde, you go, whoa, and then it takes you one second, you're like, whoa, and then you feel, realize the twist. I, I, didn't, I wasn't like that for, uh, for this one when the twist was revealed. However, again, still very engaging for me at the end especially, but if to recommend this movie to someone, I would have to say watch this at home. Watch this in the comfort of your living room. Don't go to a theater. It's still in theaters right now. It's still in theaters probably for a while still. Um, don't watch it in there because you're stuck there for three hours and especially for that first bit, it's, it's a drag. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I would give it um, 3.7 stars, not three and a half, not four, 3.7 out of five, because again, still so riveting, especially at the end. Um, super ambitious for Tarantino to make it a single location shot like that. I respected him for that call. And like, if there's someone else who was to do that, it would be even, even worse. If someone was to make a three hour movie set in one location, it would be garbage. But Tarantino, he pulls it off, mm -hmm. I still think. Well, it's one thing to be ambitious. It's, the, it's another thing to actually pull it off. And I really don't feel that he did it in this movie. I would give this film two and a half stars. Uh, there were still quite a few great scenes. Um, a lot, a lot of talking, and it didn't really go anywhere. And that's all for the Ryersonian Movie Corner. Thanks for watching.